Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Hum. I'm one of Dialogue Doctor editors, and I'm here with Vivian Figueredo. Did I get it right? Yep. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. We practiced before we turned the recording on. And then as soon as I said it, I got really nervous. So um, Vivian is new to the Dialogue Doctor community or relatively new. Um, and you're writing your first novel. Is that correct? Yep. All right. My first you novel. Want, you want to tell us a little bit about your writing journey? Um, yeah, so I um, have always enjoyed writing, mostly write uh, technical uh, reports and such for my uh, job, but have always, uh, you know, been interested in fiction and loved fiction. Um, and I think um, maybe about 15 years ago or so started taking some uh, fiction writing courses online. I had small children and was just kind of looking for uh, you know, just to learn more. And um, yeah, so after taking, I think, every class out there, I decided that it was probably time for me to actually try to write something. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I committed to this um, a story idea that's based on my uh, grandmother's story. So it's something, uh, um, it was sort of a, a family secret that we discovered, uh, that we learned uh, the truth through Ancestry.com. Um, and, um, you know, I was just, it was just in the back of my head to to do something with this and to, um, you know, really give my grandmother some closure. She never knew. Uh, she was an orphan, didn't know where she came from, who her parents were. <clears throat> um, so all of this we found out after. He passed away and, um, you know, she always carried that wound. So I thought um, I thought it would be a nice way to give her some closure. Um, and so that's, you know, where this idea came from. And um, but it's set in Cuba in the in 1898. Um, and it's required a lot of uh, research because I did not know uh, anything about the time period or, or Cuban history. So um, I spent a lot of time um, on research um, and um, and yeah, and I did, uh, I wrote a first draft, um, which I like to call a discovery draft. So it feels less, <laughs> less like an actual draft um, and, um, it, you know, got to know, I think my characters, uh, got to know the setting a little bit better. Uh, got some ideas about, uh, you know, what could happen, what could have happened in this time period uh, and such. But um, it, let's just say it didn't turn out quite. <laughs> it's, I, I'm ready to, I think, start over with something uh, a little more structured that has a, uh, you know, a coherent, that's a coherent narrative. And um, yeah, and, and that's why I'm here. I put that to rest the first draft to to draft to rest a couple of months ago and then I'm just kind of coming back to it now and trying to you know dip my feet in it without getting overwhelmed excellent so. excellent I love the term you use discovery draft I think that yeah. I think it's so apt I think so many people have these like great ideas in their head and they go and they write them down and then they get to the end and they're like now what and they go back through and um kind of aren't really sure how to make it kind of like where you are like how do I take this into a fully formed story so I and it's but it's I feel like sometimes it's as much about discovering the story as it is about discovering who you are as a writer did you have any of that experience um yeah I think a lot of it was honestly a lot of that first uh pass was trying is was really learning to let go of um some of the historical things that I know actually mm -hmm. happened and some of the um uh you know all, really all of the characters or most of the characters are based on real family members or they're kind of uh, a composites of of mm -hmm. family members um so it was hard to uh at times just kind of tear myself away from that and let um 
you know, let my main character be somebody other than my grandmother or mm -hmm. so those kind of things. I think, um, um, yeah, but I'm still, you know, I'm still as confused as I was at the beginning about what, you know, I'm like, I'm still like, what, what point of view am I going to do? What, you know, I'm still, it's all still, and I think it's, it's, I decided once I decided that I was going to think of this as a rewrite, um, you know, for a while it was upsetting because I put in so much work um, to the first draft, but then after a while it felt a little bit more freeing, like, mm -hmm. like a little bit like, all right, well, let's see what else I can come up with. Let's see. Yeah. You know, yeah. What else I have. And so that's where I am right now. Excellent. Excellent. And you may find that as you're rewriting, um, you actually go back to your original draft and you pull chapters or pieces or sections and actually you're able to reuse them um, and either with an edit or with some adjustments to it. Um, and I like how you're talking about how you were kind of using it to free yourself from the narrative. P uh, you chose uh, one of the genres of historical fiction that I absolutely love. Um, because, oh, yeah? Okay. Oh, yes, I do. I love a historical fiction because, um, and you mentioned it, you did the research about what the history is supposed to be, you know, what it was like. And I think that there's something really authentic about being able to bring those uh, pieces to your reader. Um, and then as a reader, I get to learn something about a time period that, probably I wouldn't have ever learned or experienced without reading that story. So I definitely love historical fiction. I do think, however, you um, have created some additional work for yourself in that you have such a strong emotional tie to your main character, not to mm. say that all writers don't have an emotional tie to their characters, but because it's based off of your grandmother that you may at times feel that like need to decouple what you know of your grandmother from the character. Quick question. Yeah. Did you use her real name or did you choose? A no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I changed her name. She's actually, her name is actually um, Ada um, is actually um, the first name of a historian um, who uh, she wrote a recent, she recently won the Pulitzer Prize um, for her book, uh, Cuba and American History, at Ada Ferrer. And um, I just thought her name was pretty. And also I wanted to kind of give tribute to the fact that I <laughs> uh, used her book for learning about this. So um, yes, but my mother, my grandmother's name was Myrta, which is, I, I don't think it's a pretty name. I mean, it was probably um, pretty in her time. Yes, um, but uh, some of the other names I've kept, um, nice. like, you know, like her mother's name, uh, Carmen, and our brother Pedro and Lydia. Um, nice. Uh, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So why don't you tell us, why don't we go ahead and turn to the story now? Why don't you tell us um, a little bit about the story, and then we will get into what it is you're hoping to get out of today's session. Um, okay, should I tell you maybe what I'm hoping her arc will be or how yeah, like, should I? Give us your vision for the story, um, either from a plot summary standpoint or from, you know, what, what it was about her life that you want to tell, whatever feels most comfortable to you. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so, um, Okay, so you, let, here, let me let me help let me help get you started. You mentioned yeah. that your grandmother, who in the story is Ada, was yes. um, adopted at an yes. early age. So are yes. we learning the story from her as a child, or are we picking up in her adult life? Right. Uh, no, we're picking up in her adult life. Uh, what's relevant about her childhood is that she was abandoned. Um, and she was raised by a family who was very unconventional for the time period. So she, this, and I, when I say raised, she was raised, she basically grew up in um, uh, boarding schools. Uh, this family, you know, more 
they were more like um, fostering her or, you know, guardians. Um, uh, she, you know, she wasn't like brought into kind of a family unit. It, um, so um, they were almost like taking care of her financially more than emotionally. Right. She was like a ward, right? She was like mm -hmm. a ward. Um, she, the, um, um, the doctor, because she was abandoned at a hospital, the doctor uh, that treated her was, uh, this woman, this young doctor woman, who is a very strange thing for that time period uh, for to have female professionals. Um, but she took care of my grandmother and um, uh, basically got attached to her, got interested in her and started kind of looking out for her. But she was uh, an adult. She was unmarried. So she couldn't, uh, you know, she couldn't adopt her, but she uh, would bring her home. She had uh, three um also professional sisters which was you know unusual for the time period uh, the brother on the other hand was like a loafer so it was just a very strange upbringing it was these professional women who were kind of trailblazers um mm -hmm. for their time period taking an interest in this little girl uh, and um looking out for her but she didn't really have kind of a, a traditional family life so, and she always, I think uh, my grandmother never really, uh, you know, she always had the wound of being abandoned, but she always uh, suspected that this family knew the truth of who she was and didn't tell her. So she was always, there was always this resentment. Um, and, you know, that's how she died with just not knowing and resenting this family who took her in. Um, so this is where, kind of my story comes in and um, uh, the idea that I posited was what if she, uh, my grandmother in the story, Ada, had learned, um, you know, as a young woman, the truth about her mother and her origins. What if she had found out the truth? Um, so I wanted to give her the opportunity to uh, learn the truth, which was that her mother um basically gave her up because she wanted to she had the opportunity of marrying um somebody who was uh of a higher social class um and basically the condition for that marriage was that she had to give up her children there was actually more children um and she was married um all this to say there was no when and this is what we found out later through ancestry there really was no redeeming uh story of this woman it wasn't she wasn't you know poor and had to give up her children she wasn't sick it wasn't a father who made her give up an illegitimate right there was nothing kind of there it was just this kind of Almost gross like story about business. yeah about this woman who gave up her girls so that she could um you know her family so she could move up in the world and so it was just very even for us like for her children and grandchildren it was kind of heartbreaking to learn that after the fact right because it's oh. like ew that is icky um so in the story I'm kind of making her have this experience you know like she's going to have to find out the truth about her mother um and basically process that and really learn to, you know, kind of realize that um, her real family is the family that took her in with all of their flaws and the fact that they're not, you know, the <laughs> kind of cozy family unit that she, uh, that she wished for. So that's really the, um, what started me with the, you know, with the story and that's uh, her arc, uh, you know, really, um, uh, you know, wanting something other than what she has, um, you know, kind of having to face uh, the truth and being disappointed. Um, and then eventually, um, you know, realizing that really she belongs, she's already where she belongs uh, type of thing. Um, excellent. Excellent. Well, that is quite the story. And to know that it's based on a true story, um, even though you're fictionalizing it, um, is Mm -hmm. It's very heartbreaking, you know, that your grandmother had all of this resentment because she didn't know and what would have knowing, what would that have done to her with her 
her new family versus her old family. So I'm very excited to see what you're going to do with this story. What were you Me too. <laughs> what were you hoping to get out of our session today? Oh, uh, well, I shared um, what I came up with as a plot summary. This is not what I wrote. This is, has, this is not my discovery draft. This was me trying to later put together something, um, you know, that that made more sense for the story that I, I wanted to tell mm -hmm. about my grandma, you know, about, or, I mean, it's very marginally about her, but this kind of experience that I wanted to give her mm -hmm. um, fictionally. Right. Um, and so this is what I came up with. Um, so my question first was, um, does this make sense? you know structurally am i is it does this make sense um and then the other question was i guess my big question was how do i turn this into a novel because uh you know going from 200 words to whatever 80,000 is a, a little daunting and just the idea of you know scenes and then having that i don't know it's just what what has to happen in order to get her there is is this daunting for me. Absolutely. Well, I will share with you that you are not alone when you <laughs> feel like writing a novel is daunting. I think that everyone who is listening to the podcast has that same moment of like, I want to do this. I have this story in my head. These characters are in my head. I want to get them out onto the paper. I just don't know how to do this. And I know for me, before I started working with Jeff, you know, as his editor, I really thought like writing was this magical thing that just happened. You either knew how to do it or you didn't know how to do it. And if you knew how to do it, you just sat at your typewriter because I'm that old and you just like typed out a story <laughs> and then you gave it to a publisher and then somebody else made it into a book, right? Like I didn't realize that there was so much craft that goes into it and there was so much honing and there was so much editing and rewriting I thought like you just have a story and you just write your story I think of that scene in um stand by me at the end where he's like in his office and he's typing and he like gets to the end of the story and it's perfect and it's like yeah oh, well, the that's end <laughs> like that's how writing a book should be well, anybody who actually thinks that I'm here to tell you that I've got a glance behind the curtain, it doesn't work like that. It's hard, right? Like having the idea, personally, as an editor who doesn't write, I think having the idea is the hardest thing. Um, but uh, writers who have lots of ideas <laughs> disagree with me. I think the actual writing is the hardest <laughs> part. So depending on who you're listening to, you're partway there already. So I definitely think that you have a story here that's big enough for a novel. Absolutely. But then the question becomes, how do you turn it into a novel, right? Like, how do you take the story and how do you write scenes and figure out how the scenes go together? Um, so we can do a little bit of that together today. But before we do that, can you talk to me a little bit about where you're, what happened at the end of your discovery draft? What made you feel like, this isn't a complete story that made you want to go into the rewrite phase? Um, so what happened was that I, I had a call with a developmental editor from uh, Pages and Platform from another um, uh, group and um, somebody who I, you know, whom I trust. And, and um, um, I was struggling a lot with trying to edit and trying to figure it out. And I shared not, not the whole thing, but just, uh, you know, kind of an outline. And she, um, you know, basically she said I had uh, basically two, I had kind of two stories in one, like I started out with one thing and then it went in a different direction. And I ended up with a, well, you know, I started trying to write like a worldview coming in an age kind of family love. And it ended up being like this redemption, like kind of political thriller thing. Like it just got, because I also have a, that, I mean, it's set during the War of Independence. And mm -hmm. so uh, I got kind of sidetracked by the politics. Um, in any case, it was hard, but it was also like, okay, yeah, I see it. And, um, uh, you know, so she helped me with some of the, you know, what if, you know, the midpoint is where she 
is disillusioned by the mother and right so she helped me a little bit with that um because I think what happened was that I I hurried through you know the beginning till she met her mom and then I didn't know what to write and then I went off on another direction so it was really um uh you know it was kind of like I started writing the book and then went off on a different uh in a different direction and uh this is more this is kind of this this is the story I want to say uh tell and I think um I was right I don't know how to you know I don't know how to fill it out um like uh, you know I'll give you, you know for example I have her you know I know she she's gonna she's got to find her mother but she also has a birth sister and a birth brother um and I don't know you know in what order she has to find these people or <laughs> like it, mm -hmm. uh, just even the pacing or the pieces or where they go and how much do I develop each one and then what about the family uh, that she's leaving behind? Like, what do I do? With it? Yeah, so it's more that kind of um, model of, you know, how do I get her there? Okay. Yeah. So where you are is a very common place to be in a story. So lots of times in the author community, you'll hear about plotters and pantsers, plotters being the ones who kind of have the story in their head and just sit down and write and just let the story go where the story wants to go. And then when they have it written, they figure out which parts are best and then they make the adjustments as they're editing. On the other side of that spectrum, you have plotters and plotters are the ones who create their spreadsheets and lay out every scene and figure out exactly what they want in every scene. I also think that there are people who kind of fall in the middle of that spectrum, especially new authors who have never really done it before. They don't really know kind of where to start. They just have this story. So if they're more naturally a planner, they tend to lean more toward the plotter side and start laying out their story. If they just have this story that's itching and they just want to get it out, they tend to lean more toward the pantser side. Where you are right now is in a really great spot because you've told the story once and you know where you want the story to go this time. So what I'm gonna to recommend to you is that we start laying out the different plot lines in the story, and then we just play around with them a little bit to see where you want the story to start and where you want the story to end and where you want it to overlap in the middle. One of the things that I found really compelling about the summary that you gave me wasn't just that this was a family redemption story where this woman learns to that everything that she's always wanted is actually right in front of her. You're also telling a story that talks about what it was like for female professionals at a time when women were not supposed to be professionals. Um, you also have a story of um, Cuba in their war for independence, right? Like, so you've got an almost all of your characters play an important part in that fight for independence. So one of the things that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to think about those three themes that you have created for your story. Um, women's place in society, um, what the Cuban freedom fighters are fighting for and what story you want to tell about the war. And then you want to talk about Ada and Ada's story. And then mm -hmm. once you have all three of those plot points put together, then you're going to start interweaving the story and seeing how Ada is part of the freedom fighters movement or how Ada is, um, like how the, the women's movement, and maybe it wasn't even a movement at that time, but um, the doctor who raised her and became her guardian, how her having a woman who was at the, like fighting for her space in the medical field, how that changed Ada's life, because that's going to all end up playing a part in that redemption story that you're telling. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, 
Oh, go ahead. Seems like you have a question there. No, I was just going to say the um, um, the war for independence also, um, you know, I thought this because uh, women's lives were very restrained at this uh, time mm -hmm. in Cuba. It was not, uh, it was definitely more, um, there were more advances in the U.S., for example, and in Europe. Um, but um, part of the reason that I thought the war would be a good time is because uh, you know, because the men are off fighting and this mm -hmm. often happens, right? The, there's more of an opening for women um, to, um, you know, to move around, to take on active roles in, um, you know, in relief efforts and, um, you know, in caring for the sick and, and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, and definitely all of my characters, I'm not sure of all, but um, there's definitely a... Um, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that I capture the fact that this is um, really a civil war, like her, um, you know, her foster mm -hmm. parents are loyalists, are loyal to the Spanish, whereas, you know, she and her sister and, you know, kind of the younger generation is pro-independence. And so there's that tension um, in the house. Um, again, I, um, I have a lot of... Um, you know, there's a lot of family stuff going on in my head. I had uh, mm -hmm. um, her husband is is based on my grandfather's grandfather, who uh, was a doctor and, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> served in the revolution in the with them. And there, I had a lot of people who were ancestors who were part of this independence movement. So it's also, um, uh, you know, also kind of important to honor that um uh, that period but yeah I thought um they my women could have a lot of so you know they they were spies they were you know they were doing all kinds of things and I thought that that would be an interesting um you know there would be interesting uh opportunities there for you know for plots <laughs> um yeah excellent yes and you know this is one of those things where you know you have a good story when there's a lot of things that are happening. On the other hand, as an author, you don't want to overwhelm your readers by giving them too mm -hmm. many stories. So mm -hmm. you just have to make sure as you're lining up the stories that everything ends up making one coherent story. So what I've done for you, um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Maybe I'm going to share my screen. I do this every time I say that I'm going to do it and then I don't <laughs> and then just know do what it. I'm doing. I think this is where I want to be. Okay. Can you see? I see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you see the little chart that I've started here and it's very, very minimal. We will do a little bit of work on it together today. Um, now, Verona was the name of the family who adopted her, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you had said something that was, I thought was important in your story that I just wanted to write down because I didn't want to forget it. The parents were, you said they were pro something. I can't remember what you said they were. They were pro. Uh, the, they're, they're pro they were loyalists. So they, this is uh, the war for independence um, from Spain. Uh, Cuba was a Spanish uh, colony. So the parents are loyal to um, the Spanish uh, uh, crown. And then um, their children. So um, Ada's, um, Ada's guardian um, and yes. hers is Virginia. Virginia. Thank you. And she is not a loyalist, correct? That's what you were saying. Mm -mm. And so mm -hmm. she was, you said pro independence. Is that the phrase? Yeah. Mm -hmm. now was it her end they would have been called like they would have been called rebels okay. uh you know it's uh, um yeah okay now was it just virginia or was it virginia and her sisters because you mentioned she had three sisters right um yes i don't know how many of them i'm going to include in okay. the story but but um but yes no they were all um um they were all uh pro-independence so the the younger generation and then Ada and her husband as well 
um, although they try to keep it, uh, you know, they try to be discreet about it out of respect for their parents. Got it. Um, and how much does Ada's husband play a role in the story? Um, so Ada's husband is, um, well, first of all, I'm not sure because I'm starting over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but Ada's husband, um, I have him exiting fairly early on, um, because I, um, um, because I, I, I thought she should kind of struggle the through this on her own um and he um she is very young um actually she's I have her at 19 now she was 17 in my first uh, in my mm -hmm. discovery draft I'm like trying, I'm like maybe I'll just poke you know push her up a little mm -hmm. bit um that's the joy of fiction you can make anything you want happen make her a little older but her husband is older he's a doctor he um uh, and, you know, she, because she's so young, she does kind of uh, depend on him. Look, you know, she is, she is very immature. She's a, she's immature. She's impulsive. She's, uh, you know, she's a little bit, uh, you know, she's, she's a handful. And um, so I have her husband, you know, and her husband's kind of a, a steadier, more, uh, I, I based him off of my grandfather. He's a very, kind of earnest, serious, hardworking, um, but he gets himself in trouble. Um, and he has a, um, this is based on my grandfather's grandfather, um, who had a friend warn him that the Spanish, um, that he was going to be arrested for his uh, uh, activities in support of the, I mean, he's been caring for wounded uh, rebels. Um, so her husband has to leave, um, you know, go into, um, uh, you know, basically go out into the uh, mountains to join the rebels. Um, and I have that happening um, early in the story. Okay. So how does the fact, so a couple of questions about her marriage. And here's the thing about a storyline like yours. All of the elements in your story have to make sense to us as the reader. Yeah. So, and they need to make sense to us in an emotional way. So when you're talking about the fact that this immature, impulsive handful of a young lady is getting married to an older, more serious, more reserved man, what is that doing to her as a person? Is this her choice? Did she meet him and fall in love with him? Or is this man chosen for her by her guardian and the people who gave her their last name? We want to think about that because that's going to change how she feels, especially because she also has some resentment for this family already. So as you're thinking about her story and why she leaves this family who those of us who were not adopted feel like, well, shouldn't she be grateful that this family, this loving family took her in, but people who are adopted, they don't always see it that way. As much as they're loved and they're wanted by the family that adopts them, there's always this question or this wound, like you were talking about your grandmother had about like, well, what was it about me or my birth family that they, we, why couldn't we stay together? Right? Like, so you want to be able to tell that wound, but all the people, mm -hmm. so like, when you're talking about she has this husband who very quickly goes away, just because he goes away, it doesn't change his impact on her life because she's still married, mm -hmm. but now she's married and she mm -hmm. doesn't have this husband. Does that give her more freedom right. to go away or does it give her less freedom? Does that make her more resentful of what family is and is like, see, I even picked this man because I thought he could be a good family and I would never be abandoned because if your story like and that's how you figure out what your themes are if her theme is that mm. she has to get over the sense of abandonment then her husband leaving just 
ratchets up those feelings of resentment and anxiety. On the other hand, if she met him and fell in love with him and it's this immature impulsivity that makes her want to marry him even though he has to go away and go into hiding to be with the rebels then that just reinforces her immaturity and her desire to have this perfect family and she pines for him while he's away and she becomes Mm -hmm. a spy and is like running whatever like when she goes you know you can kind of figure it out that way Um, And this is, of course, where also where you're going to have to take some fictional liberties as an author and move more away from your grandmother and grandfather's story into Mm -hmm. the fictional life of (laughs) because you're going to need to find what it is, what story do you want to tell? Mm hmm. Yeah, the um, yes. So uh, she no, she married him. She fell, she married him from for love. He uh his family um uh opposed the opposed the marriage. Um and so she uh she convinced him to elope. So they eloped. Um being an orphan um in Cuba at this in this time period, um her um race would have been in question. So um his family uh, doesn't feel comfortable her mar- you know his marrying an orphan because it's mm-hmm. not they can't confirm that she's white basically okay. um this is a racial you know this is a racialized society um so she uh right so they've actually eloped um and um in the first draft act in the discovery draft i actually had a lot of um her in-laws in the story i you know, when she, you know, she actually moves in with them for a time when she leaves home. Um, but I think, um, I don't know if I'm going to include that. But um, but the, the way that I'm envisioning her dynamic with uh, Virginia is that she, um, Virginia has told her that her mother died, has told her that her mother loved her. So she basically, Virginia built up this fantasy um, about her mother uh, that her mother loved her, that her mother, you know, uh, you know, wanted to be with her. Her mother died. Uh, you know, this is how I'm I'm thinking about it now. Mm-hmm. So Ada has kind of fantasized uh, about this. She has some childhood memories of just, you know, her mother's singing to her, her mother, you know, her mother's voice, her mother's touch, those kind of things. So, so for Ada, um, um, you know, and growing up in boarding schools, she's always been kind of teased about this family she has and about her uh, sister, Virginia, and like, why, you know, she's unmarried, she's, uh, she wants to be a man, right? She's trying to live a man's life. So she, <clears throat> Virginia, I mean, Ada, as I imagine her, you know, still really relatively young, kind of teenager uh, really trying to pull away from Virginia. This is how I'm envisioning her. She's at this phase where she's trying to differentiate from Virginia. Uh, Virginia has always wanted her to keep studying to, you know, uh, you know, be independent, study, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, hell no, I'm getting married and I'm having my little family and you keep your books and your whatever, right? So it's her kind of, it, in a way, it's kind of a reverse story because her rebellion is having a traditional family Mm -hmm. uh because uh you know that's her way of rebelling against Virginia is like oh no I'm gonna get married and settle down and uh (laughs) you know there's nothing you can do to stop me kind of thing um but um you know but a I I believe um I'm not sure yet uh she might be having uh, trouble conceiving you know she hasn't conceived uh her, you know, her husband has to go. So there's kind of that, uh, you know, where it's not quite working out. Her, she's not quite able to implement her her pretty vision um, uh, at this point. That's how I had it. Um, you know, that, that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, okay. um, so you've talked about how kind of this she has this desire for family and a a traditional family unit 
probably yeah. spurred on both by her loss and from the teasing at the boarding school. She has this mm-hmm. desire to be fall into a traditional woman's role. Um, mm-hmm. And yet the person who's raising her, who is encouraging her studies is very liberal and pro-independence and pro-education and pro-women's equality. Um, Mm -hmm. How does Ada feel about um, the war on independence? Is she pro-independence because her husband is pro-independence or is she pro-independence because she believes in it? Um, that's a good question. She's pro-independence. Um, and I, I, I don't quite have that figured out. Um, she, um, in my, in my first draft, I had her at the beginning being kind of, um, you know, not that, um, you know, a little bit more apolitical where she's, kind of interested and she's kind of pro-independent but she's kind of caught up in her little right she um she was more just kind of self-involved at the beginning not Mm -hmm. quite um um I I don't know what I'm going to do in this you know in the next round if it'll be if it'll if I'll have her be more involved at the beginning I feel like she I don't know. I, it depends how much I end up changing her personality. Mm-hmm. She, it seems yeah. that she is a little bit, uh, a little self-involved, uh, that she's kind of helping the cause, but is it really, you know, she, she, you know, when she, when she, like, she'll sometimes make, uh, you know, pro-independence comments to kind of, just to kind of get a rise out of the old, out of the parent, right? She's kind mm-hmm. of, uh, uh, you know, she, um, you know, where she'll say something about uh, Cuba needs to be a uh, rule itself. And then, you know, gets, you know, her foster father gets all flustered and she's just kind of kind of having fun with him, messing with him. Okay. Um, so that's how she, that's kind of the, the type of person she was in, at least in my first draft, she was more uh, apolitical, but still, uh, you know, but still, you know, still doing stuff in support of the, of the, um, of independence. Um, so I'm going to change our um, chart just a little bit. And we're going to use Ada's story. And we're going to keep putting the plot points. As you may have noticed, every time you gave me a plot point, I went ahead and I dropped it into the Ada's story column. And but mm-hmm. we were leaving the women's role in the Cuban War for Independence columns blank. Um, mm-hmm. So the other thing I want to put in here is the role of family. So, so if you think mm-hmm. Ada's story having three themes to it, you know mm-hmm. in the beginning she has this desire for the perfect family. Yeah. And this idea of the perfect family that she has is based off of what society is saying the perfect family should be. A mom, a dad, a couple of kids, maybe a dog. I don't know. Cuba was different. <laughs> <laughs> maybe dogs weren't pets then. I don't know. Um, but like she has this idea of this perfect family that she feels like was torn away from her unjustly, right? So she has a lot of resentment. At the end of the story, you've identified that you want her to come back to her family and understand that the perfect family is the family that she already has, right? Mm -hmm. Matt, I did not want that to go on that page, of course. Okay, so she knows that her family is perfect. That's where you want her to end up there. This idea in the beginning, you have that she's resentful of Virginia. Oh, I'm so bad at spelling. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that's not wrong. Um, 
or I'm going to just say breaking the mold just for shorthand. How does she feel about Virginia and women's roles at the end of the story? And if you don't have the answer to that, mm. right, that's okay. But that's something that you're going to want <clears throat> to figure out as you're telling your story. Oh, I think she's going to be proud of, I think she's going to be proud of, of uh, Virginia. I think she's right. Mm -hmm. And how does she Yeah, she's going to be. Oh, go ahead. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, no, I um I haven't fully thought it through, but I think she will um um yeah, I think she'll be uh she'll be proud. Um is she also going to want, and this isn't a question you have to answer now, but something that you're gonna want to think about, is it just that she's proud of Virginia or is she starting to embrace some of the things that Virginia made important for her so like education it seems like in the beginning she was at boarding school because that's where she was supposed to be but as soon as she got out it was about just about the husband but at maybe as the husband is away and she has to take on more and more responsibilities it leads her more to this understanding that hey not just I'm proud of Virginia but I'm going to embrace breaking molds or going back and getting an education something like that with the idea that you want Ada's growth to be something because the way you're telling the story is kind of a redemption or a coming of age story. When you're telling a redemption yeah, story or a coming of age, we as readers are going to understand the immaturity in the beginning, the selfishness that comes with immaturity. As long as we get the reward at the end that, oh, she figured it out, right? Like these things yeah. that she's been pushing against are something, and it doesn't have to work out exactly like that. You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. but that's kind of what you want to think as you're building your scenes is how does this scene here, she's getting married for love. How is that playing into your theme of the perfect family? How does this play into the role of, women and how she feels about how her guardian is pushing her to be something that's different than what women traditionally are. And then maybe, and you don't have to have every scene being all three of your themes, but you also, in this case, I'm going to put all three of them in there because she has been using independence as a way of getting under her guardian's skin. But now she's marrying somebody who's willing to give up his life and his marriage for the rebel cause. That's got to do something mm. to you. So that's where the other mm. thing you're going to have to figure out is, does she mm. stop using the war as a way of getting a rise out of people, of maybe playing people against each other and she embraces it or whatever it is? You're going to want to figure out that storyline as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. So where yeah. do you go from here? The way that I would recommend that you go from here is to take this little chart that we've started and think about where you want Ada to start and where you want Ada to be at the end. You don't have to finalize that right away, but just think about it. And then as you go through your story, write down all the major points in her life that are going to be critical for her growth arc. So I added some of the stuff that's probably before the story you're going to tell because you're going to use those elements. I mean, you could start the story all the way back then, but you mentioned that you kind of wanted to start the story when she was 19, but knowing what happened to mm -hmm. get her to 19 is going to be important. So any of those big highlights, mm -hmm. maybe her graduation, or maybe the first day they drop her off at boarding school, maybe the first day they mm. bring her home from the hospital to live with their family, like whatever those big points are, just put in a new call, a new section for it and just write down what it is and how it impacts her desires for family, her understanding of women's role and her understanding of the Cuban war, right? 
at okay so the first the first column it's kind of events or important points and then uh the other ones are more kind of how it's impacting her or that yep how it's impacting kind of her change yep i see okay yep. because then what you're going to be able to do is if you have a scene that isn't really leaning into one of these things, you may decide you don't need that scene, or you may decide that mm. there's something in that scene that needs to affect one of these things. So for example, when you said to me that her husband leaves right away, in my mind, that is a critical event for somebody who was abandoned as a child right? Because that's going to play mm -hmm. into this idea mm -hmm. of family. Maybe you decide it's not part of family because she's telling him to go because she'll do anything to protect him. And it's actually reinforcing her need for a perfect family because in her mind, her mother is, gave her a way to protect her. It wasn't, it's not until later that she finds her. So you're going to put all of those important points in here. One of the things that you're going to make sure that you do is figure out the whys or the hows. So, right, like she lives all through here. You mentioned that Virginia has created this fantasy that her mother's dead, right? Sorry, let me just make sure I put that in here. She's dead, but loved her, right? So if she thinks mm. her mother's dead all the way through the story, how does she end up meeting her birth mother? How does she find out? Does Virginia let it slip? Does she run into a woman who looks like her? Does she see an article in the newspaper? Like, what is it? What's the what's the inciting incident, if you will, that makes her go looking for her birth mother? You mentioned in an earlier draft or in the summary, I can't remember, that you have her leaving this family where she has safety. Why is she leaving? Is she leaving because she comes home and she's been living with them and she can't stand it anymore because they have all these high expectations of her of education and getting a job and all she wants to do is settle down and have babies, right? Like there's nothing wrong with that in her mind, but the family that she's living with is resentful. That's why she goes out on her own and she thinks that, you know, whatever it is that you that you figure out, that's going to have to be part of the story because it's a big part of this idea that she has resentment against the family that's raising her. Something has to get us to the place where she meets the mother. And then when she meets the mother, the mother isn't exactly warm to her. Why is she then seeking out the sister and the brother? Because she thinks that maybe they have the same story and they're going to commiserate. Maybe not. So you have to kind of think through all of those different pieces of the story. Now, if you are a plotter, you're going to want to do every one of these things before you start writing. If you're a pantser, you may get to the point where you're like, okay, the husband goes into hiding and now I want her to meet her mom. And I know there has to be something about why her like what happened after her husband left that made her want to go meet her mom and you just start writing and as you're writing the story unfolds and it tells itself right I don't know what kind of writer you're going to be um, in this you may feel really comfortable on one side you may feel really comfortable on the other you might parts you might know and you want to write down and other parts you just want to free form I would also suggest that you go back through the draft that you've already written because you mentioned that there are lots of parts in the draft that you already written that you excuse me that you have already written that tell different parts of this story. It's probably why your past editor was like, "Well, you've got this story, and then you've got this story, and you've got this story." There's I'm sure there's a lot of great stuff in there that you can go, oh, I really like this point I was making about the war and about how there are spies in the war. Maybe it's not Ada who becomes a spy. Maybe it's Virginia and she finds out Virginia is a spy. And at some point she has to do something to protect Virginia, which then ends up reinforcing this idea that family is based off of love. But you're mm. also going to have to figure out where your story ends does the story end at, you know, my sister and brother and mother from my birth family are not what I needed. So now I'm going to go back into the arms of this other adoptive family. 
you know, what's what else is happening there? Is it just that she goes back? As a reader, that might feel like not enough is closed if you only fill the family desire. That's why you're going to want to think through, mm. especially if you already have like a spy in the war theme going in some of your chapters, you're going to need to close that out too. Does this happen at the end mm-hmm. of the war? Does it happen at a breaking point in the war? You know, kind of thinking through, it's a lot, but by doing right. this, laying it out, you'll be able to figure it out. And then you'll be able to figure out, you know, who needs to be in what scenes. For example, you mentioned um, the husband's family and in your discovery draft, you had the husband's family and them living together. Maybe you do decide that they don't need to be part of um, the story from the sense of she went and lived with them, but perhaps they need to be a part of the story from a different perspective. Maybe you bring them back later on and maybe the reason she runs to her birth mother is, and again, I'm just taking some crazy editorial liberties here. Mm -hmm. It's probably not good, but just as a brainstorming, maybe when they find out that their son has gone to live with the rebels, they come to the um, adoptive family's house and they bang on the door and they're like, where is she? Where is she? She's keeping our son from us. And then that's when she realizes that her family that, you know, is who's supposed to protect her isn't protecting her. And that's when she runs to find her mother. I don't know, whatever it is, Mm. or maybe because you had mentioned that they were against the marriage because she was adopted. Maybe after he married her, they went and they hired the private investigator or whatever the equivalent in the this time frame i can't remember what you said the 20s um, 1890 1898 98 so whatever the 1898 yeah. equivalent of a private investigator was it's um, probably the same I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they hire somebody to figure out who um who she is and they come to their house to confront um, their son and be like, you got to divorce this woman because she's not who she says she is. She has this family that, you know, she's not even talking to. And that's when it all comes crashing down around her. So, and it doesn't, obviously it doesn't have to be that, but like thinking about what is the point where she's young and impulsive and she's frustrated and she's resentful, but she's trying to do things right, what's the point that it comes crashing down on her is something mm-hmm. that you have to figure out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. I like this little table. I think it'll be. Yeah. So, I mean, you can use an Excel spreadsheet. You can use a table. You can use um, post-its, a whiteboard. Different authors use different tools, but what you're going to want to do because you already have a discovery draft that you're feeling like needs some alignment to be a full story, something to help you organize your thoughts that get us to the point where she is an immature, impulsive 19 year old to wherever she ends up at the end of the story that's closure for her or for your reader. She doesn't Mm -hmm. have to have closure, but your reader has to have closure. So you Mm. want to think about all the points that are there and you've got a lot of story here. So by Mm. laying them out and thinking about how they play into your themes, and maybe you decide as you're laying it out that this women's role is not something that you want to be a theme and you want to pull it out. That's fine because you've got enough going on here with these other things. Not every single scene has to lean on a theme, but if you have three themes, you're probably going to want each of your scenes to lean in at least one because otherwise Mm -hmm. your book is going to get really big. If you have only one theme, then the stuff that happens between your critical points in the arc of the theme can be a little bit more just about the story and less about the theme. So what you might want to do is you might want to think about kind of after you, and you could do this either way, you could do it after you lay out all the scenes. If you have all the scenes kind of in your head, keep laying them out, keep putting them in there, moving them Mm. around. You could, you could do it that way and then kind of draw lines and be like, most people don't go from immature, impulsive handfuls to like 
strong, independent, mature people in like one jump. It's like a struggle. They start moving forward and then something happens and they go back to being their immature self. And then they move a little bit farther forward and then they move back. And then as you're building this table, you can put in a section where like, this is, this now becomes like phase two. And actually let me do this instead. Let me add another column, which is going to mess up all the spacing. This is why, this is why if I had thought about it ahead of time, I would have used Excel because it's just a little bit easier, but this works because we're already here. How do I put in? There it is. Oops, you had it. Thank you. Okay. So this can be like her phases. I don't love that term, but in the interest of time, we'll just, so she, here she's still immature. Mm. And then maybe here. She shows some maturity and then maybe here she reverts to, she has a really immature moment and I am not at all looking at what I put those next to. Um, Right, 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 right. You're kind of just, yep. Right. And this will help us understand, will help you understand the modulation of her voice, but it will help us as the reader. Um, I, I see you have a, a questioning look on your face right there when I said the modulation of her voice. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Um, no, I just, <laughs> um, I just wasn't, it, I don't know. I, didn't, I wasn't, I was trying to think what, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll explain that in, a, in just a second. Mm-hmm. Let me finish my thought. So once you figured out kind of her growth arc, that's how you're going to know that you have all the right seeds. Because if you make a big jump in her growth arc from immature to completely mature, then your story is not going to make sense to your reader. It's going to be like, well, yesterday she was this and now she's this. Now there are moments in people's lives that make them have to grow up immediately, but you have to make that happen in your story. So, right. When I said you're going to use these moments to help modulate her voice, as you're describing Ada's voice, you're going to figure out what her features are as somebody who's immature versus what you want as somebody who's mature. And I'll give you an example of that. Someone who's immature tends to talk about themselves a lot, right? Like I did this and I want this and I think this and I want, right? Like a lot of I. So in your initial Ada's voice, you can put that vocabulary of very egotistical, very self-focused. Maybe she's always the first and the last person to speak in a scene. As she starts to grow in her maturity, she realizes that that I focus is very selfish and that she needs to embrace other people. So slowly over time, instead of being the first and the last person to speak, maybe she slowly goes to letting one other person speak. And maybe it's just she lets her husband speak first, but she's still always speaking before her guardian, right? So, and you can, you can play around with it there. Maybe she slowly stops using I statements and starts using we statements. Maybe instead of always saying, well, I think I want, maybe sometimes she starts asking, well, what do you think? Well, what do you want? Mm. Right? Like not a lot. She doesn't all of a sudden like give everything to everybody, but just we'll see, you want to see a little bit of that peaking of like maturity come up. Taking other people's uh, (laughs) feelings into a more empathy, more. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Got it. That's how you can modulate. So then when you get to the end where she's this fully formed adult who cares for other people, realizes what family is about, you it doesn't just become this, well, yesterday in the page before she was still throwing temper tantrums when she wasn't getting her way, but now all of a sudden she's caring for other people, right? Typically doesn't happen like that for a person. Yeah. So the more nuance you can put in the phases of her growth, the more your story is going to feel authentic to your readers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So great. Great. Thank what you. What other questions do you have? Um, I don't have any questions right now. Um, 
I think I have a lot to, I mean, I have like plenty to <laughs> keep me busy here for a while. Um, but I like, um, I like this idea of the faces and kind of thinking about, you know, what would be happening in her, you know, in her life at these times. And then, um, yeah. And then this idea of kind of mapping it onto the, um, onto the various themes or story, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Themes I think will be helpful because, um, I think that's where, yeah, I think that's where I'm struggling a lot is how all these things will, you know, how to, it fits together. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe just trying to have it, having it in one place and just trying to, you know, move things around, um, yeah. I think might get me there. Absolutely. And like I said, you're going to figure out what works best for you. If you're more of a plotter, you're probably going to want to do your phases first your starting positions, your ending positions, and what it means at each of the phases and what growth you're going to see, and then go back and fill the story in. If mm -hmm. you're more of a pantser, you're going to take, okay, I know she's this immature, impulsive handful at the beginning. I want the first scene to be her having a big blow up with Virginia about her husband, whatever, or her future husband. And that's the first scene. And you just start writing the story from there and you let the story tell itself. And then you go back after, you know, every couple thousand words and you're like, okay, let me write down what I wrote in this chart so I can see my progress. And then you keep writing and then you figure all of the chart out as you're writing. If mm. you're kind of in the middle, then maybe you have the story points in your head and you start with the story points and you add some of the phases in and you realize that, okay, there's these two phases are coming too close together. I need to add a couple more scenes or, you know, these two scenes have the same level of maturity, but I actually feel like I want to put something else in the middle. And then maybe it's like, you're writing it and you really have a clear understanding of one of your themes, but you're really struggling with another theme. So you actually spend some time writing a scene to be like, okay, what do I really want her to feel like as it relates to this theme? And you just sit down and you write a short story or a couple hundred words of like, what are her thoughts on that? Like she's talking to her best friend. What would she say to mm. her best friend? Because you're also, as you're writing the story, going to need to find somebody in the story that she trusts, that she can talk to about her feelings on this. Maybe she has a best friend. Maybe she has a cat. Maybe she has a really close connection with Virginia's grandmother because she really connects, even though she doesn't really believe Virginia's grandmother's family, she really just, the woman has taken care of her the way, I don't know, right? Like, this is why I'm not the, an author. I mm -hmm. <laughs> have a million ideas, none of them are good, but you're going to want mm -hmm, somebody mm -hmm. that she can talk to. If you decide you're writing it in first person point of view, that becomes less important, but it's, not as compelling to your reader to just hear all of this as first person thought instead of in conversation. So something to think about. Right, 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 right. The whole okay, point so of what I'm needs... saying is mm -hmm. you don't have to fill out the chart left to right, top to bottom. Use the chart as a tool based off of how you are as a writer to figure out what your story is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. I think I cut you off. I think you were going to say something. No, um, no, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Wait. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story um, and letting us walk through it and uh, being able to come up with this chart. I love what you've got here. You know, everything that you're telling me about Ada, um, as we peel back the layers and like, as we look more into what her life is like, I really want to read your book. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I just have to write it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn the recording off and we can keep okay. talking for a minute. Okay. Um, maybe. See, I, I do this too. There it is. I'm going to stop sharing first and then I'm going to turn off the recording.